reversible reactions are those which go in both directions. So in this example you have A plus B forming C and D. But those C and D can also bump into each other and form A and B. Reversible reactions reach something called dynamic equilibrium. So in this example here we have A reacting with B, so they bump together and form AB. What can also happen in a reversible reaction is that this AB joined together can break down into A and B separately. So both reactions are going um, in different directions. Dynamic equilibrium is reached when the forward reaction equals the backward reaction. Let's think of an example. So imagine you started off with a load of A and a load of B. Initially you have no C and D. So the only reaction that's going to take place is A bumping into B and the forward reaction. After a while you're going to end up having some C and D, so the chances of those two colliding with the correct activation energy increases. At some point there's going to be a, a situation where the, the rate of C and D is going to be the same as the rate of A and B, and that is your dynamic equilibrium. Now this doesn't have to be bang in the middle. It doesn't mean that this is going to be 50% of A and B, 50% C and D. It could be something like 90% of C and D and only 10% of A and B. The point about being at equilibrium is that once it reaches whatever concentration of A and B and C and D, once it reaches the equilibrium point, these concentrations no longer change. Let's look at an example. So initially, I've got 100 moles per dm cubed of A and 0 moles per dm cubed of C. After 2 minutes, it's quite a fast reaction, I end up with 40 of this and 60 of C. After 3 minutes, it reaches dynamic equilibrium, which is 10 of A, so 10 moles per dm cubed of A, and 90 moles per dm cubed of C. Now, the reaction is still going on. It's still going on in the forward direction, so A plus B going to C plus D, and it's also still going on in the backward direction. But now that I've reached e dynamic equilibrium, let's have a look what happens at minute four. So at minute four, we still have 10 moles of per dm cubed of A and 90 moles per dm cubed of C. We leave it for another minute and at 5 minutes again 10 of A, 90 of C. Another minute 10 of A, 90 of C. In fact if we left this for now for a few days or hours it doesn't matter we're still going to have 10 of A and 90 of C. So at dynamic equilibrium one of the key points is that the concentration does not change. The other key point is that the reaction is still going on except the forward rate and the backward rate are occurring at the same speed. So a reversible reaction is one where the products of the reaction can themselves react to produce the original reactants. If a reversible reaction takes place in a closed system, that means where none of the products or the reactants can escape then the reaction will reach equilibrium. A very common question in the exam is for them to ask you to define dynamic equilibrium. So this is where the forward and backward reaction take place at the same rate and there is no overall change in the concentrations of the products or the reactants. In this example I've got x plus y going to u plus v equally u and v going to y plus x. So let's imagine we've got a situation, say um, initially you start off with 100 of x, 100 of y, 0 of u, 0 of v. After uh, 5 minutes it reaches dynamic equilibrium. So you have 80 of x, 80 of y, and 20 of u, and 20 of v. Now, imagine that you want to get lots of u and v. At the moment, you've got about uh, a 20% uh, yield of your u plus v. Now, remember, it's in dynamic equilibrium, so even if I wait much longer, nothing's going to change in terms of the concentrations. Even if I wait a day, it's still going to be 80 of x, 80 of y, 20 of u, 20 of v. 
However, I can get more of U and V if I change the conditions. So reversible reactions, you can get more of what you want by changing the conditions. If you imagine the concentrations of X and Y and U and V being on a line, so right here I've got 100% of X and Y and right here I've got 100% of U and V. At the moment we've got 80 of X and Y and 20 of U and V, so at the moment we're somewhere around here. What I want to do is change the conditions so that the equilibrium is shifted to the right so that I end up with more products. So what I do, okay, let's imagine I change the conditions, the equilibrium shifts to the right, now it's around about here, so now I've got 70 of U, 70 of V, 30 of Y, and 30 of X. So if that's what I want, if it's U and V that I want, this is much better. And the way I did that is I just changed the conditions. The conditions we're going to consider are temperature and pressure. First off, we're going to consider temperature. To be able to understand how temperature affects a reaction in equilibrium, we have to know about exothermic and endothermic reactions. So exothermic reactions are reactions that give out heat and endothermic reactions are reactions that take in heat. If a reaction is exothermic in one direction, it must be endothermic in the opposite direction. In this example I've drawn here, the equilibrium for this reaction lies about here. So that means we've got roughly 70% A and B, 30% C and D. So I want to shift it more to the right hand side. So how can I do that? Well, when I increase temperature, it will go towards the endothermic direction. So I don't want to increase the temperature because if I increase the temperature, the equilibrium will shift in the endothermic direction. So it will shift this way. Now I don't want it shifting that way. So in this example, because the forward reaction is exothermic, if I want to get more of C and D, what I have to do is decrease the temperature. So let's say initially the temperature was at 50 Celsius. So if I want to increase my amount of C and D, I need to decrease the temperature. So what I'll do is I'll put the temperature down to 25 Celsius. What that's going to do is it's going to shift my equilibrium to the right hand side, making more of C and D. So by doing that temperature decrease, I now end up, the equilibrium is now about here, so now I've got 50% C and D, 50% A and B. What I could then do is decrease the temperature even more, and I'd end up with more of C and D. The problem with doing this is that by decreasing the temperature, I've slowed the reaction down. So I might end up with more of C and D if I take the temperature right down, but it's going to get there much slower. So initially, at 50 Celsius, it may have taken one or two minutes to get to equilibrium. Admittedly, equilibrium was pretty rubbish, as I only had 30% of C and D. I took the temperature down to 25 Celsius. I got a much better yield, 50%, but it's going to take a lot longer to get to that equilibrium. Now it's going to take maybe one hour. I decreased the temperature lower, maybe to like minus something, I may get a much higher yield of C and D, but now it could take days to get there. And when you're a big industrial company trying to make stuff, you need it to happen quickly. So there's a sort of trade-off between getting the amount of product that you want for an exothermic reaction and getting it in the best possible time. The other condition we're going to consider is pressure. In this reaction, we have nitrogen gas reacting with hydrogen gas, forming ammonia. This is known as the Haber process. In this reaction, the equilibrium lies strongly to the left. What that means is we have lots and lots of reactants at equilibrium, but not very many products which we, which we want. So we want to shift the equilibrium to the right-hand side. And one of the ways we can do that is by changing the pressure. When we increase the pressure, the equilibrium will shift in the direction with the least number of gaseous moles. If you look at the reaction, you can see we have 
one molecule of nitrogen gas reacting with three molecules of hydrogen gas forming one molecule of ammonia gas. So we've got a total of a ratio of four gas molecules on the left hand side and one molecule of gas on the right hand side. So if I increase the pressure the equilibrium will shift to the right hand side meaning I get more products. Equally, a decrease in pressure would shift the equilibrium to the left-hand side, making more reactants. Now, pressure only affects reactions with gases. And it also only affects reactions where there's an un uneven number of gaseous moles on either side. So if there were four gaseous moles this side and four gaseous moles this side, pressure would have no effect. I suggest you pause the video in a sec and try and work out the following questions. What I want you to work out is for reactions one, two and three, what would happen if I increased the temperature and what would happen if I increased the pressure? So hopefully you've had a moment to think about that. First off, question one. If we increase the pressure, the equilibrium will shift to the side with the least number of gaseous moles. As we have two gaseous moles on the left side and one gaseous mole on the right side, increasing the pressure will shift to the right hand side, forming more of C. As this is an endothermic reaction in the forward direction and an exothermic in the backward direction, if we increase the temperature, the equilibrium will shift in the endothermic direction, forming more of C. For question two, increasing the pressure has no effect because we have two gaseous moles on the left-hand side and two gaseous moles on the right-hand side. Increasing the temperature, however, will shift the equilibrium in the forward endothermic direction, forming more of Z. For question three, we have two gaseous moles on the left-hand side and five gaseous moles on the right-hand side. So if we increase the pressure, the equilibrium will shift in the left direction, from right to left going to the side with the least number of gaseous moles, so forming more of our reactants, A and B. The forward reaction is exothermic, and the backward reaction is endothermic. So if we increase the temperature, the reaction will shift in the endothermic direction, so again, we'll form more of A and B.